teachers back to classroom teaching this week and other teachers teaching remotely for uh, a period of the next few weeks. And we've got a series of activities to help you with that, um, with that teaching. Bruce, Nicola, do you want to just quickly say a bit more about yourselves? Sure, we'll do. And I've just turned on the recording, so apologies. We cut the start of your intro off, James. But I'm I'm Bruce Feuder. I'm a computing education specialist at the ACA, uh, and have worked in schools for 15 years prior to joining the ACA. And well, um, I'm excited to be able to share that the experience that I built up and the work that we're doing with teachers in Victoria, Nicola. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, James. Hi, everybody. My name's Nicola O'Brien. I'm part of the team at the Australian Computing Academy and I specialise in primary education computing teaching. I get really excited seeing young children engage with computing and technologies for the first time. I'm particularly interested in getting girls involved in programming activities as well. Thanks, Nicola. Great. So I guess uh, now that we've done introductions, I'd like to uh, acknowledge or the ACA would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, their connections to land, sea and community and pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. So the agenda for today is essentially a run through for all of the activities that we've got happening over the next four, uh, four the series of four webinars we're going to be doing. Uh, we've done a bit of an introduction about who we are, and then we're going to discuss the role of coding in the curriculum, introduce Scrock Learning, which is the platform we're using to deliver the digital technology challenges and the school cybersecurity challenges, talk a little bit about some of the unplugged resources we've developed in the curriculum tools, and then go into a little bit more detail about the weeks ahead. We'd like to remind everyone that this session is being recorded, so um, just be aware of that. If you, We do encourage you to contribute. Uh, we have access to the chat window if you want to send any messages to us uh, during the chat and uh, if we will have opportunities for you to also to contribute via your microphone as well. So um, you know, take advantage of that uh, with, a, with a group here that I'm sure has, special, has an interest in both primary and secondary education and the expertise we've got on the, on the team. We're happy to answer any questions about the topics we cover. So, to get started, we'll talk a little bit about where coding sits in the curriculum. Um, there are expectations that vary from years three up to year eight, and it's year three where implementation sort of kicks in and the expectation of students to write code begins. The expectations can be summarized as being able to write code to solve a problem or build some kind of solution. Um, and that includes testing that as it goes, testing it against criteria that have been developed or set of requirements that have been provided. And they do that in either a visual programming language when they're in primary school or a general purpose programming language in high school. Uh, so that's a natural progression. And you'll see as we demonstrate some of the work we're doing that that move from visual programming to general purpose programming is um, supported through the way that we present both of those to students inside the platform. Now, there are a number of concepts and coding constructs that we introduce from year three to year eight. The first concepts that we introduce, uh, um, other than the sequencing and procedural language that is present in all computer programs, is user input at year three and eight and branching. Those two are introduced together because it's the ability to respond to what a user uh, inputs into a program or the environment provides into a program that makes branching interesting. And that determines then what the code will do in response to that input. We then introduce iteration or the concept of repetition and loops in year five, and that continues through to year eight. And then the new concept that gets introduced in year seven and eight is functions. So we've got a whole heap more uh, of expanded detail on those things. If you visit our curriculum unpacking website, which we'll talk a little bit more about down the track, um, but generally uh, that gives you an overview of sort of where coding sits and what the progression looks like as students move from primary school through to high school. Um, and Bruce, one thing that's worth just quickly pointing out now is that there are some slight variations in terms of the content descriptions in the Victorian version of the Australian curriculum. That's mostly about um, how things are grouped into strands in Victoria. So rather than the two strands that we have in the Australian curriculum, there are three strands in the Victorian version. There are a couple of words here and there that are different, but otherwise referencing the Australian curriculum as a uh, as a starting point for interpreting the Victorian curriculum um, will do you just fine. Yeah, that's right. And that's one of the great things about the Victorian implementation is it's so close to the Australian curriculum 
that you can really rely on the resources being developed for the AC to, to fit very, very nicely into, uh, into the Victorian classroom. So because we are going to be demonstrating a lot of the resources that are available on Grok Learning, um, one of the things that we suggest you do is set up an account if you haven't already. Teacher accounts are free on Grok. Uh, they don't cost you anything to create and get started, which means that as a teacher, you can dive in and start the challenges immediately. Uh, there is a verification process that will attach you to your school. And once you do that, you'll get immediate access to student data and the ability to allocate courses to your students to make it easy for them to identify what work they need to complete. And we've got a full step-by-step -step guide at aca.edu slash start that you can follow if you want to know how to get your um, students up and running with the digital technology challenges. Now I'm going to throw to Nicola to talk a little bit about the DT challenges themselves and how that fits in terms of um, access for students and all those kinds of things. So Nicola, I'm going to pass over to you. Thank you very much, Bruce. I will have a look at the DT challenges now. So as Bruce mentioned, we're going to take a look at some of the DT challenges. Uh, for those who are new to looking at what we have available on the ACA, the starting point to access all of our resources is aca.edu.au forward slash resources. Everything that we make available here is free of charge for the applicable year groups. So the DT challenges are free for students in years three to eight. Um, Bruce is also going to talk about the cybersecurity challenges shortly, which are free for students in years uh, seven to ten. So on this page, the easiest way, there's a wealth of resources here, as you can see, um, it's best to use the filters on the left hand side. And you can find exactly what you're looking for by filtering by year groups, uh, by activity type, or by technology type. So uh, one of the languages Bruce mentioned in the very, um, in the overview to coding before was we used Blockly or visual programming for primary. So if you're after a DT challenge, you can click on Blockly come up here and tick on DT challenge, and you'll find all of the challenges and resources we have available for students, which are suitable for primary students. One thing I'll point out here, which I think we'll go into a bit more detail on later, are these small circles underneath the main image. These give you some very high level curriculum information about what each challenge covers in terms of our mapping to the Australian curriculum, which as Bruce mentioned, is very similar to the Victorian curriculum. Uh, the, there are also DT mini challenges. These also cover the curriculum and our online coding courses. They tend to be shorter in length. Uh, one thing to notice about all of these, I'll come back to scratch in a moment. For the rest of them, these are self-marking courses. So as a teacher, your students work through them independently. Um, they submit problems, they receive answers and feedback on each problem. So your students can move through at the right pace for themselves. And the great thing for teachers is that you don't need to know every answer ahead of the students. You'll be able to access teacher notes and your students will get guidance through the tips and the marker. Um, you'll also see here we have three courses available introducing the Scratch programming language. Um, these have teacher notes, they have problems, um, they don't have auto marking in them at this point. So the students can work through Scratch problems they'll probably require a little bit more involvement from teachers at this point uh, if students get stuck. But all the notes and tips for teachers are provided within the course to help you out as you go. So I have one course open to have a look at just to give you a little flavor. Uh, this DT challenge is a mini challenge. It's a, it's a very introductory one used by many three and four teachers to introduce Blockly. The general outline of the course is that we have these slides which are navigated by clicking through. A number of the slides just have content and the reading standard in this course obviously is very, very simple, designed for younger readers. We have video and interactive content to keep the course moving quickly and be enjoyable for the students. Some of our slides have interactive widgets where we ask students to move blocks around. I'll jump over that one and get straight to one of the problem slides so you can see it in action. We include instructions on the left-hand side for the students to go through. Um, we have narration available in a number of courses for students that may have some difficulty reading the instructions. 
And in this case, it's a very simple problem where we're asked to move the Wombot 50 steps to reach a carrot. And so we can come across here and edit. Now, move Bruce out of lay on my screen. I can run my code and see that I successfully got my Wombot to the carrot. And that's success for the students. Um, this big red star you can see here is the auto mark feature. And here we go. Congratulations. Nothing like a live demo. I got my one point. I got the one block to move successfully. So, so Nicola, do you want to get something wrong now? I've always the risk for a live demo. Do you want to get that length wrong and see how the feedback is? Pains me to do it, but why don't I go ahead and do it? Well, I'll you know, as, as an employer, I'm always trying to push you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens if I have something incorrect. Okay, so I get not just a wrong answer, but I get some helpful feedback to help me navigate next time to successfully get to the bomb. It doesn't give me all the answers. It just said maybe I was too far or not far enough. So this is an example of a very introductory level course. A couple of features I'll show you while I'm here. As a teacher with a verified teacher account, you can access answers. So if you would like to sneak ahead and see what's coming up for the students, you can click in and see the model answers. Um, you can also see the teacher notes, which will give you useful information about how this course fits into the curriculum, um, what we're trying to teach on a particular slide, if we've observed that there are things which can trip the students up or ways to help students problem solve their way through. As a teacher, you can access this. Obviously, the students can't. Um, and the other feature we have available in some of our courses until October, sorry, not October, August, that's correct, isn't it, James, is tutoring. Um, this is typically for slightly older students, I would say, but we have some live tutors available. And if a student's really stumped, they can sit here and ask a question and get some feedback from an actual human. Um, year three and four students, first question is often, are you a real person or a robot? But rest assured, the tutors are real people. And teachers can also access the interface. So if they have assigned, if you are assigning a task remotely and you are asking students to work through this from home, this is a way you can communicate directly with students and they can say, hey miss or hey sir, I just can't figure out what's happening on the slide. And you can have a look at their code, see exactly how many times they've submitted um, and help them give them some guidance or some feedback to problem solve their way through. And um, when you're you're using that tutoring interface, you can actually see exactly which problems and which set of interactive slide steps uh, a student has completed for courses that have those interactive steps. So you'll notice on um, Nicola's screen on the left-hand side there that a number of those um, circles, which represent content, and diamonds, which represent completed problems, um, if they go green, it's an indication that Nicola has completed the task. If the problems go orange, it means that Nicola has submitted something, but hasn't actually passed all of the test cases yet. And so it gives you a good overall sense of student progress before you go to help them answer a particular question. For example, in this Wombot course, if the student hasn't actually completed the interactive steps on the previous slides, the first thing would be to say, how about you go back and have a go at those slides before you try and solve this problem? Thank you. Um, the other thing I can show you, let me just see, shall I show you the teacher dashboard now, Bruce, or is that coming up on a later slide? Well, I mean, we could do it now. I mean, it doesn't matter what order we do these things in. So let's dive into the dashboard. Okay. So, um, one of the other really important tools you have access to as a teacher is a dashboard. So this is a dummy class, which I've created with the exciting names of student workshop. Um, but you can see here, this is a tool that helps you both manage the class and monitor progress. So you can assign students into classes, either in bulk or individually. And what's really great here, you can see their progress. So these four rectangles represent four modules of a course. And anything that's got a green bar means a student has submitted a problem and it's been marked correct. Uh, anything, as you can see some down here that are orange, means there's been an attempt at a problem, it's not yet been marked successfully correct. And the white space means no problem submissions yet. 
So this can give you a very quick snapshot across a class of where everybody's up to. Um, and this is a permanent display of student progress. So this uh, will update in real time and you can monitor how your students are going. The other feature that we have recently added is view live. So let me get back to my class list, which I think I can come to here. Okay. I can also view live now. You won't see anything in here about this at the moment, but we have a picture coming up in the slides. Oh, those pop ups. Let me just make that go away. Okay, so live classroom lists the students and lets you see in real time what your students are working on. So if I had students at the moment, if Lisa and Ralph were working, we could see them minute by minute submitting problems, reading slides, uh, whether the problem's marked correct or whether they need to keep working on them. You get icons on the left hand side, which you see in the picture that we have, which are for students struggling, if they're working, um, progressing well, or if they're offline. So another useful tool when you're working remotely to see if you've asked your students to work on this over, say, a two hour block, this would be the tool to pop in and see who's been working well, if someone needs a nudge, if someone needs something extra to do. So that's a very useful way while the students work through DT challenges to keep an eye on them and support them without having to be involved in every problem that they work on. And the, the reason why we call that live classroom is essentially we're trying to replicate the experience that you would have as a classroom teacher if you were just walking around your classroom, um, seeing how students were progressing with, with each of the, the questions. And so being able to identify when a particular student has made a lot of attempts and could really do with um, an intervention, either um, just some encouragement if it looks like they're close or some specific feedback uh, or ideas just to point them in the right direction to solve that particular problem. The feedback from teachers when we introduced um, these new features in uh, term two was extremely positive. Lots of teachers talked about wanting to continue using the live classroom features even uh, when they were back teaching in person again. And so I've just um, shown the, the screenshot we've got of a, an active live classroom view with uh, some sort of student attempts and things visible. You can see there the little eyes that indicate where a problem or a question slide has been viewed. The little um, diamonds indicate when students are working on problems, whether they've been marked, whether they've been successful, where they're struggling. So you can see the little red, di red diamonds with question marks in there that indicate that a student has had multiple attempts at a problem and is struggling. You can use those little visual flags as a way of being able to identify which students are gonna need support. And you can also see there on the left-hand side by the student names, um, the flag there to say whether a student is online, when they were last online in the case of the gray, um, the gray ovals there with how long ago it was that they were on and when someone has stalled because they've, they've gotten stuck on a problem. So all of that information being available to you right there for any groups of students you set up. So remember that you can customize your groups of students in any way that you like. You could have it by class, by year, by group of students in your class. Um, if you know that there are a group that are particularly um, struggling with things uh, and at the moment with you being online, it could be that you want you know, different subgroups in your classes set up so that you can keep an eye on those that are struggling the most and are gonna need the greatest amount of support. All of that is completely customizable for you in the, um, in the main view for, for um, the, the live classroom and the, and the student dashboard. So we've talked about the dashboard and the live view. Um, one of the things that I wanted to flag, which we've sort of alluded to, is that enrolling students as assigning courses can occur relatively easily. You can do it manually. You can upload students via CSV. So if your school has a, an export feature available from your student management system that already has students in class groupings that make sense, then you can access, uh, you can do an export from your, your school management system and upload that. And if you're using Google Classroom, you've got import available for Google Classroom as well. So there are lots of easy ways to bring your students into the course and assign them to the, the individual challenges that you're going to be working with. 
And one of the things that we'll be doing as we work through the next uh, four weeks of, of content with those teachers that want to get involved is we'll, we'll take you through the process of getting students up and running uh, so that you can make the best use of the courses and features available inside the platform. Now, the other uh, challenges that we want to talk a little bit about are the school cybersecurity challenges. So the School Cybersecurity Challenges Project is a project that is a partnership between us, the banking sector and the Australian government. And that includes four activities that cover a range of topics from information privacy and security through to data encryption, network security and web application security. So a lot of coverage there and all of them are, as you can see from the little icons across the middle there, linked to different aspects of the curriculum. These challenges are designed to be very accessible. Uh, some of them have a very low barrier to entry and don't have any technical expectations at all. And some of the others are actually quite technically challenging for students who are looking to explore some of the more um, programming-like aspects of uh, cybersecurity and the digital technologies curriculum. So one of the things that I thought I'd do very quickly is show you the exa some examples of what the challenges look like before we dive into those later in the week. The first one that I'm gonna demonstrate is the information security and privacy challenge. So you can see that we've created a separate interface that has a phone, a smartphone. The intention being that we wanted students to have an experience that would be very similar to the experience they have when they interact with other people online. And of course, most of those interactions occur via a phone. So we've got, a communications app where the questions are sort of framed in a context that makes sense for the individual problem that's being explored. And then we've created a number of other apps that do various things. So most of the time students are gonna spend their time in either fist bump or flash tag. Fist bump is effectively our Facebook. So you can see we've built a whole uh, environment, a whole, big group of friends we did this by hiring actors who provide us with a whole lot of images and bits and pieces that you know, allow us to build a, a genuine environment that would be reflective of the kinds of social networks that students are involved in. And we also uh, got teenagers to go back and have a look at the language that was being used so that it looked very, very genuine in terms of the way that the communication between students was taking place. So you've got fist bump, and flash tag, flash tag being a bit more Instagram like. So the emphasis here is on the photos and, you know, it uses a very sort of different feel in terms of the way that relationships between people on the platform um, uh, are modeled. But the idea being that in this challenge, students are given a series of increasingly difficult problems that require them to hunt around inside these apps for information that potentially reveals personal uh, personally identifying information and so it the intention was not to to sort of um, tell students that this type of interaction is not okay because we know that they're going to engage in these kinds of activities online anyway but to demonstrate to them the risks involved in participating in online social networks so we're going to spend more time exploring this particular challenge in the first session with our secondary teachers um, but it, uh, we thought we'd, we'd showcase some of what's what's to come in addition to that, um, we've got a more technical challenge that we'll be looking at later in the series, which has a look at cryptography and explores some of the cryptographic techniques that we use in classical ciphers, relates that to uh, modern cryptographic techniques, talks about things like frequency analysis and has a sort of non-technical or non-programming type um, questions and problems for students to explore. It also has a series of videos that have been um, recorded and put together by partners the previous at our various organisations. The shortest and most common words in English. And I can't pause the this now. first few lines of All Star by looking. There we go. Um, so we've got this video and videos from other professionals from across the partners who are, uh, have put, been putting together and they talk about the concepts and how they fit in, in the corporate world. And then, as I was saying, also a series of programming activities that students get to explore as well to see how programming can simplify and automate a lot of the ways that we explore these um, cryptographic techniques and cryptographic ideas. So the cybersecurity challenges are another aspect of the digital technologies curriculum we do want to explore. 
uh, and we'll be taking you through the basics of how to get up and running with those uh, and, and getting students through that process as a way of engaging them with a digital technologies curriculum in a different context. Anything you wanted to add to that, James or Nicola? Well, I, th I think the main thing I would say first is that if you're a primary teacher watching this webinar, we'll actually be uh, in the next few months releasing a primary version of the, the first challenge that Bruce demoed. So the feedback from teachers so far has been really amazing. Um, we have found that students really get into this fake social media world and immediately forget that it is fake and start talking about the characters and the things that they do and the information they inadvertently share about themselves and each other. And um, so students have found it very much to be an authentic learning experience. And there's a lot of collaboration and discussion in the classroom amongst the students as they try and sleuth for that information. And then, of course, because we've got the careers part as well, then students can discover that this is a talent that they might have, identifying this information and extracting it from social media. And then in the next video, can um, it could be presented by someone whose daily job is to do exactly the kind of skill that they've just been developing. So the, the resources uh, for the cybersecurity challenges are very powerful. We've had very positive feedback for teachers. The main feedback has been, when can I get a version of this for primary? Um, we've heard that message loud and clear, and we're currently working on a year five, six version of this, this first challenge. So expect to see that sometime later on this year. For the purposes of the activities we're presenting to support Victorian schools over the next few weeks, um, cyber will be just for um, uh, secondary uh, students, but later on in the year that'll be different. And uh, Bruce, we seem to have switched. Um, there we go. Thank you. Right. So, um, uh, so what we're going to be presenting is a mixture of some of the DT challenges content and some of the cybersecurity challenges content, um, and all of that is freely available to schools right around Australia. Thanks, Bruce. Great. So, a couple of other things that we wanted to talk about. Um, Nicola mentioned the uh, the student other uh, solutions and teacher notes that are present in all of the digital technologies challenges. In addition to that, we've got downloadable notes and lesson plans that are available for the DT challenges and for the cybersecurity challenges. These include a whole heap of other additional activities you can do with students to explore the same principles and ideas outside of the, the computer, essentially. Uh, it shows you the curriculum mappings. It gives you a number of different ideas that you, you can explore. Uh, and it provides some advice about what the implementation of using the challenge may actually look like when you're in um, when you're looking to use these in the classroom. Now, in addition to that, we've got a DT at Home series, and the DT at Home series was put together with the specific purpose of being able to support teachers who are in a situation where a lot of the teaching that's taking place is occurring remotely. So you've got students at home, you're looking for ways that you can engage students in very short, easy to access, easy to do activities that don't require a whole lot of additional resourcing. In particular, we wanted to make sure these were accessible to students without technology. And so what you'll find is these are all downloadable as various PDF files. They address very specific individual components of the Australian curriculum and therefore the Victorian curriculum as well. And they provide you with the types of things that students could do with their parents or on their own without a lot of teacher guidance. So in addition to the problems themselves, they come with uh, teacher explanations and walkthroughs that go into detail about exactly what it is that the, um, the, the activity is covering and how that fits in with the curriculum and how that can apply in a broader context. So they're really nice, sort of self-contained, one-hour type maximum activities that students can easily get on with without having access to a teacher to support them through the activity. And uh, given how much time kids need to spend um, online in remote learning, even for the kids that do have adequate device access, it's really good to get them up and away from their devices um, and engaging with other concepts in digital technologies around the home. Now, the other resource that we wanted to point you to and one that we'll refer to extensively throughout um, the, the next four weeks is our Unpacking the Curriculum resource. 
what we've effectively done is taken the Australian curriculum content descriptions and gone into additional detail about what the implications of the content description actually are, since many of them cover a broad number of concepts or ideas in a few short sentences, um, and sometimes even, even less than that. One of the things that James talks about a lot is the fact that when writing the curriculum, and both he and I were involved with that alongside Paul and Anna, the other writers, is that we were very restricted in terms of how much we could put in a content description. And even though Victorian, the Victorian curriculum was rewritten, a lot of those same restrictions were in place there too. And so with such a small number of words, a, a small budget, if you will, of words and dot points, it was extremely difficult to make sure that teachers were really clear on exactly what the expectations of the curriculum were. And so this website actually breaks the curriculum down into smaller chunks that, on the basis of the key concepts that are present in the curriculum. And it goes into a lot of detail about what each of the content descriptions involves, what the different aspects of that are, and even provides some examples of the types of things that students should be able to do as a result of engaging with the curriculum in a meaningful way, and includes suggestions of the types of activities that you could potentially do in the classroom to address those expectations. Bruce, do you want me to have a look at that on screen and do a live demo? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, Bruce, be uh, be risky. <laughs> also, we seem to have lost your video, Bruce. Have you? Oh, okay. Yep, we've got your screen share, but we can't see you anymore. Uh, I don't know. Share my screen on the unpacking page, and we can. All right. Look at that. There you go. I can see what it is. The um the video for turning this the button for turning your video on and off is on your drop down for screen share. So occasionally you click that when it expands. Um, <laughs> okay. All right, Nicola. Okay, so here we are on the unpacking page, which I've put the link to in the notes for everyone to have a look at. Um, down the left hand side, we can see the key concepts, which are the points in the curriculum Bruce referred to as being very constrained in terms of what information actually appears in the Australian curriculum. Um, implementation is the one that most often comes up in coding. So why don't we have a look at that? We can click on unpack. James Bruce, feel free to direct. Um, and we can see right here for year five and six, as I hover over different words, implement digital solutions as simple visual programs involving branching, iteration and user input, and then here we have what these digital solutions are, so a little bit more detail. Translate an algorithm into a program for a computer to run. Students can write, so write the code to solve a simple problem and testing, something often overlooked in the teaching of digital technologies. Um, and then down below in the constructs, we have more information about these key terms. What is a user input and what does that look like when it's implemented at a year five, six level? Yeah. And so the key thing basically that we, we tried to do in putting together this unpacking project was all of the things that we talked about when writing the curriculum. So there's not a single word that's in a content description that we didn't go as a writing team. What does this actually look like in the classroom? The problem is, is that um, you don't get to write that in a curriculum document. So the content descriptions are deliberately um, devoid of uh, detailed examples, uh, it's devoid of pedagogy, um, and and of course when we were actually writing the curriculum, this is exactly what we talked about all of the time. If we didn't know and couldn't describe to each other what we thought it would look like in the classroom, then it never went into the curriculum. And so really this, this unpacking is just the reverse of the process that we went through in writing the curriculum in the first place. We literally broke it into these different categories and then looked at how those categories actually progressed. Nicola, could I get you just to zoom right back up to the top and click on it on um, an individual year level? Let's do the year five, six band, just to show in the reverse direction. So what the unpacking allows you to do if you're teaching a particular band is first of all, see the relationship between the band description, the achievement standard, and then the content descriptions, and um, see the specific elements and how they are um, pulled apart for each of the content descriptions for that band level. So the other view is useful if you want to see how a particular um, key concept develops over multiple bands. But on most most occasions as a classroom teacher, 
you're just going to be looking at it from a particular band level and understanding how all of those things interlink. So if you click on any one of the colored bits within the achievement stand and say, well, yeah, that'll do, and the band description, it's going to take you down to exactly that corresponding um, key concept and then pull that apart and really tease out all of the all of the very succinct language and turn it to real classroom examples. Thanks, Nicola. Thank you. I think while we're here, what we mentioned before was that we have these circles available on the resources page for each coding course. So if we go back to that Wombat that we looked at and ask for more info, if you're wanting curriculum coverage for a particular course, you can come in here and the parts of the language which are highlighted in the key color. So for us, implementation here in green, you can see very simply that for year three and four, this Wombot course is going to pick up all the key elements of the implementation content descriptor for years three and four. Um, and we have that information available for all of our plugged and unplugged resources on that resource page now. Yeah. And before we go back to the slides, um, Nicola, it might be worth just going back to the ACA homepage and pointing people to our um, uh, um, uh, our mailing list, so joining our mailing list and also our phone number. I think it's Excellent. Be... Um, keep in touch is where you can sign up to our mailing list. Uh, and here's our phone number here and we pick up the phone. Um, and you can always email us at help at ACA. We are, are pretty responsive and yeah. have lots of people on the team that really like answering hard questions. Yeah, and in fact, more than just we, we pick up the phone, we're paid by the Federal Department of Education to pick up the phone. Doesn't doesn't ring the red phone doesn't ring anywhere near as often as we would like so if you decide that you are going to join us on this um, digital technologies challenge journey over uh, the four week period through August that we're going to talk about in a minute don't think that your only support available from us um, are these professional development webinars um, we will happily answer the phone if you're stuck at any point or send us email to help at aca.edu.au uh, we will don't be surprised if you ring us up, the person on the other end is almost in tears with excitement because the red phone doesn't ring anywhere near often enough. We're here to support you. And likewise, if you don't like talking on the phone, we're, we're on social too, if that's your weapon of choice. Absolutely. All right, so shall we return then to talking about what, what's coming up next, Bruce? Let's do that. So. Um, we've got a number of webinars coming up that we're excited to be involved in. Four weeks starting on Tuesday, August the 4th, we're going to be running it as a teacher session at 3.45, same time as this on a Tuesday. And during that session, we'll effectively be introducing some, con some content and some activities that we're planning to run with students later on in the week. And those, those times will be at 10 a.m. for a primary session and 12 p.m for a secondary session on the Thursday. Those are sessions that you can either do in real time with students and we guide them through the activities with your support in the classroom or um, as recorded webinar sessions that you can then run with your, your classes at a more appropriate time. We know it's very hard with secondary schools with, a, with varied timetables to have a time that's gonna work for everyone, but this provides you with a, a fixed time when you know that you can let, teach, let students who are not able to attend school for any reason engage with some professionals um, who are well up on the content and have that additional support that, that you can provide through an online forum as well. So we're really excited about the opportunities that this is going to provide. Um, we'd love to see as many of you and your students there as possible live in real time. But we know that you know the, the complications associated with getting everyone there at the same time is going to be a challenge. So um, where those are coming up and we've got a number of different activities that we're going to explore over those four weeks. Um, here's the outline of what those topics are going to be. So on the 4th of August um, and the 6th of August, we're going to be running through a coding with the Wombot activity, the one that Nicholas sort of showed briefly. Uh, for primary students, and we're going to look at the cybersecurity challenge, and in particular the information security challenge for secondary students. We've got two weeks then of coding with the turtle, 
either in Blockly or Python, depending on whether you're a primary or secondary um, teacher slash student. And then the final week of the series, we'll be doing some micro bits in the classroom work with primary students and taking a look at the cryptographic slash programming activity for cybersecurity in the secondary stream. Um, and if you go back and look at the ACA uh, resources page, you can see exactly which of the key concepts and which of the content descriptions those challenges um, cover. And that will give you an idea of the specific content um, that we'll be covering from the Australian curriculum in that four week period. We'll also be looking at a number of unplugged activities. So for example, in our cybersecurity um, challenges, we've got some card decks that we use to get kids thinking about which information they can share online versus uh, what information is not safe to share online. For the coding with the wombat, we've got some unplugged activities to get kids thinking about um, uh, our concepts of algorithms without having the um, uh, distraction of the device in front of them. And if you're a school that's using things like a B-Bot, then we'll talk about how to actually tie in um, various other resources and activities you might already have in the classroom. Now, in addition to that, there's a whole heap of other support that we provide. We've got all of the information on our website at aca.edu.au. You can find out about our other webinars that we'll be running, a separate series of events that will be happening on a weekly basis as well at aca.edu.au slash events. Um, and then you can also reach out to us via help at ACA. Um, the on the phone number that we, we showed you is accessible on the website or through the socials, either our Facebook group, Teaching Tech with ACA and Gronk, or you can look up on um, look us up on Facebook and, uh, and Twitter. So in terms of preparation, if you wanna know what can you do to get prepared for the session on the 4th of August, one of the things you can do is, if you don't have one already, set up an account on Grok Learning and have a little bit of a look at the resources that are there. In particular, if you're a primary teacher, you may want to dive into the Wombot, or if you're a secondary teacher, have a look at the um, Information Security Challenge as a starting point. Um, but we'll be going into detail for those down the track. Now, remember, accounts on Grok Learning are free for teachers, and the resources that we'll be showing you are also free to use with your students for the year levels that we'll be targeting. So that's year three through to eight um, for, the, for the digital technologies challenges and seven through 12 for cyber. All right. Yeah. And if you've, um, uh, if you've registered or you, your school has transitioned across to your new um, uh, email addresses, you can actually do single sign on integration for yourself as teachers. You just click on, when you go to log in in Grok Learning, you click on the um, use SSO link, and then that will take you across to an option. Bruce is going to do it now. No, except so, I have to do it in a private window. Yep, because you're already a learning.com. So if you go to log in, um, and then you can click on the use SSO, and you'll see the Victorian Education and Training, and you can click on that option there. That doesn't work if it's your old EduMail address. That only works if you've got the new um, uh, Microsoft EduPass email addresses. Um, we understand from the department that everyone is eventually transitioning over, um, but the time frame varies from school to school. All right. So. An opportunity for us to answer questions. We've hit 4.30. If there's anything in the chat, uh, you can put questions in the chat or we'll turn your mic on if you've got any questions that you want to throw our way. But so so there's, there's already uh, one question. Um, the, the teachers, uh, actually Deborah's just mentioning that the, the accounts for teachers are free. Yes, everything in fact on the Grok Learning platform, even the otherwise paid for activities for students are always free for teachers free for your professional development and pre free for you to explore to decide whether you want to use them with the in the classroom. Um, and Deborah's also pointed out that uh, almost all teachers have now migrated across to the new um, mail server. So if that's the case, use the single sign on integration, you'll find it a lot easier to get yourself started up. And we won't need to manually verify you as a teacher, which means you get immediate access to things like the uh, teacher solutions as well without having without us having to ring the school and confirm you are who you say you are. All right, so reach out to us on Twitter or through other um, 
other means. Like I've said, we're on socials. We're always keen to hear via email and phones. Uh, thanks for being involved this afternoon and we look forward to working with you and your students as part of our four week webinar series starting in August. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for that presentation. I, I really enjoyed every minute of it. So <laughs> um, thanks for doing that.